Watch this. The organization that brought you the only Anne Frank Memorial in America is about to get a lot bigger. The Wasmuth Center is expanding. A new building named for a one-time governor and longtime human rights advocate. The next big thing happening in space has another Idaho connection. NASA is crashing into an asteroid, and an Eagle grad is going to help figure out if it worked. He's a planetary defender. Meanwhile, on this planet, one of the biggest storms of the year is racing towards the west coast of Florida. So what does what's happening way out west have to do with what's about to happen way back east? A lot, at least from a meteorological standpoint. It became, became clear to the mayor the department needed different leadership. That was the reason Boise Mayor Laura McLean asked for the resignation of Boise Police Chief Ryan Lee late last week. Right after we went off the air Friday, almost immediately following the story shared by KTVB investigative reporter Alex Duggan, that announcement was made. The story detailed several claims and official complaints of a hostile work environment under Chief Lee. Two officers, no longer working for BPD, spoke to Duggan about name calling, about poor treatment, and about the culture at BPD that led to longtime officers retiring. They weren't the only two. So Boise Police Department is looking for a new chief as of, well, Friday. Chief Lee will be technically still chief for about three weeks, but those weeks will be spent on leave. Beginning tomorrow, Tuesday, longtime BPD officer and recently retired Ron Winnegar will return to reprise his role as acting chief, something he did just a few months, well, about a year and a half ago. A search is on to find a full-time replacement. We expect to learn more about that tomorrow when Winnegar is officially sworn in as interim chief. Protests against Black Lives Matter rallies, swastikas showing up at the Anne Frank Memorial, white men in white masks, Patriot Front, showing up at a pride festival in Coeur d'Alene. Extremists and hate groups have ties to Idaho that go way back beyond what we've seen over the last two years. Human rights, or the protection of, get spotlighted during incidents like these. And it's not uncommon for folks, and us exactly, to turn to the Wasmuth Center for Human Rights to get some perspective. They are the nonprofit that brought us the Anne Frank Human Rights Memorial, the only one still in the United States. Well, that group is about to get bigger. At least their building is. A brand new center will soon break ground right next to that Anne Frank Memorial, and it will bear the name of an Idahoan who is well known in such endeavors to spur change. Here's Joe Paris. This iconic Idaho spot, the Wasmuth Center for Human Rights in Boise, is set for a big upgrade designed to be a beacon of light in the community. We are so excited. We've received word that ground is breaking within a matter of weeks on the construction of the new Wasmuth Center for Human Rights. Dan Prinzing is the executive director of the Wasmuth Center for Human Rights. In October, crews will break ground on a new two-story structure that will be located across the way from the Anne Frank Memorial. The memorial receives 120,000 visitors a year. Now, when visitors come, and they'll see that education center with that welcoming, come on in, let's continue a conversation. And I think what that's gonna do, not only in framing in Idaho's capital city, in the state at large and in the nation, that here is a commitment to education. It is devoted to education, and it is the power of human rights education in changing hearts and minds. Having a physical space to talk about serious issues facing our world and community is a major step to creating change change that Prinzing says is to foster a climate and culture of upstanders who embrace respect, compassion, equality, and justice for all. It's where do we amplify those voices of good and in times of darkness and when hate begins to pull at us in the community, the Wasmuth Center has always stood as that beacon, place where we can amplify the voices of good, stand a little taller, get a little louder, and really echo the words out of Anne's diary that yes, no need to wait a moment. We can start now, start slowly changing the world. The Education Center is slated to open in August of 2023. Before it can open, though, it needs a name. And that name is now selected, chosen for an Idahoan who made human rights a focus of their career. Recently in conversation with former Idaho Governor Philip E. Batt, his wife Francine, we are going to name the building the Philip E. Batt Building. We caught up with Governor Batt earlier this year when he celebrated his 95th birthday, a celebration that included former Idaho leaders, movers, and shakers. Prinzing says when you reflect on Batt's life like they did at his birthday, 
It's clear his name is perfect to join people like Marilyn Schuler and Bill Wasmuth as Idaho leaders who embody embracing human rights. It really is a tribute to Governor Batts' commitment to human rights in Idaho. You know, when we look at when he was in the legislature starting the Idaho Commission for Human Rights, legislation to protect farm workers, it is his personal and professional commitment to human rights that really that is the legacy he has left and what a fitting tribute as folks step into the memorial, into the center, and to see the governor's name right there in association. Well, I know, I know so much, and our, we are the best people as well as the best state. Education will be the emphasis, an emphasis echoed by inspirational icons with a passion for human rights. One of my favorite quotes etched in the stone of the memorial by Confucius, do unto others is that you would have them do to you. To me, that's what the memorial represents. It's what the work of the Wasma Center represents, that it's how do we really treat one another as a community? How do we come together? Even in times of division, how do we come together and have that conversation? You know, we're a firm believer. Maybe you and I may never agree, but maybe agreement is not the end goal. Maybe the end goal is mutual respect. I hear you, you hear me. Let's sit together and have a conversation. So again, they're going to actually start the actual construction in a matter of weeks, and Dan Prinzing telling me they're hoping they may even be ahead of schedule. The goal, though, is to have it open next August. And Brian, of course, next August, there'll be a big ceremony, mm -hmm. and there'll be uh, a lot that goes into it. But, uh, I mean, that's a big deal to have a, a, a building at the Human Rights Center and Memorial here in Boise named after Phil Batt, former governor of Idaho. An onion farmer from Wilder became the 29th governor of the state of Idaho and then only the third to receive the Idaho Medal of Achievement. So, I mean, it's well-earned and well-deserved, obviously. And there's a clear reason as why he's getting this honor. This isn't just a random, let's pick a name. I right. Phil Batt is very well-respected. And the work he's done in terms of human rights, you heard Dan Prinzing talk about it, very impressive. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Well, it began as a last-minute, let's call someone in this town and figure out how they, well, how they say their name. That FaceTime phone call to Hutter about a month ago ended with a revelation that maybe Idaho's smallest city isn't just a novelty town being squeezed by two of North Idaho's largest cities. We were told then there was some question as to the leadership of the city. Was there a mayor? Was there a city council? And who's paying the water bill? Well, a week later, after that first phone call, we found out, yes, there is a mayor and there is a city council, but Hutter's pilotage problems persist. The subsidy of Hutter is only about 30 acres and it's home to only about 100 people, which is sandwiched between Post Falls and Coeur d'Alene. And there's a chance Idaho's smallest city by size could soon be dissolved. It's an old idea, first reported by the Coeur d'Alene Press and once again floated during a meeting last week with the Kootenai County Commissioners. Hutter's clerk was there to face the music and the board for not turning in the city's budget on time for approval. Not only that, paperwork wasn't filled out properly, there were wrong email addresses exchanged, and. Well, this wasn't the first offense for the city, which is why when Mayor Brad Keene and City Clerk Lang Sumner asked for an extension to file that budget, well, the commissioners carried little compassion. We're a small town. This is a second job. This is, this is 40 hours on top of 40 hours. And absolutely, this is habitual. This has been happening for well over a decade with Lang Sumner as City Clerk. I'd be happy to work with you on clarification so that there is no other errors. For me, I would not be inclined to grant the extension because something's got to change. Something drastic has got to change. And maybe, maybe the city decides to disband. And the red flag for me is habitual. Mm -hmm. You guys have mentioned this. If it were one-off, okay. But it's been habitual. Hopefully, you'll, you guys will work really hard and um, you know, do good for your residents or think about, you know, being absorbed by a, a neighboring city. Think about being absorbed by a neighboring city after 117 years of being, well, a standalone city. That lady we first spoke with on the phone, we called about a month ago. She said her water bill, the one she paid in March, was just recently cashed. So there's something going on there. There was also a continual lack of response from the city of Hutter, according to the commissioner. So they decided to not approve that extension. So what now for Hutter? Well, they won't be able to levy any property taxes for the 2023 fiscal year, so they're not going to have any extra cash coming in. And their budget is only about $100,000. The only city services they provide is water, so they don't have to spend a lot either. But the city apparently has twice that amount in the bank, up around $200,000. They call it a rainy day fund, so consider it raining in Hutter. But Sumner says they should be fine for the year.
A spacecraft is about to space crash into an asteroid at 14,000 miles an hour. No, it's not Hollywood. It's outer space, like nearly 7 million miles away. And that impact may not be felt here, but the math to figure out how it did will be done by someone from here. So stick around if you want to see that happen live. And while we wait for that to happen, just grab your phones and send us a quick text message about the show or pretty much about anything in the 208. 208 321 5614. Don't forget, include your name and the hashtag the 208. Oh, and stick around even longer because we might share a few of your messages at the end of the show. Okay, this is exciting. We are about to witness a first. For the first time in human history, we are about to crash a spacecraft into an asteroid on purpose in an attempt at planetary defense. And we don't even need Bruce Willis or Ben Affleck or Steve Buscemi to make it happen. This is what it looks like right now. This on, you can see, well, over there, there it is, that. That is the asteroid Dimorphos and Didymus. Didymus would be the big one. Dimorphos is the small one. That's what we are aiming for. And we are sending a satellite right now 14,000 miles an hour towards it to crash into it. We're going to keep an eye on that as it happens. More on that in just a second. But we also have an Eagle High alumnus involved in this project. Dr. Harrison Agrusa graduated from Eagle High in 2013. He graduated from the University of California in 2017, where he studied physics and astrophysics. And just recently, he earned his Ph.D. from the University of Maryland. Well, today... He's watching that collision well, like the rest of us are, only he's doing it from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, the place where they built that spacecraft, that satellite that's going to crash into that asteroid at about 14,000 miles an hour, like I said. They call it the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, because asteroid, double asteroid, I should say, because it collides with an asteroid that happens to be the moon of another asteroid. Redirection because they're trying to change the orbit of that smaller asteroid, and test because, well, that's what this is. We're not in any danger here on planet Earth. We're just seeing if we can do it should we need to later. So we thought we'd get Harrison to help us understand what DART is. In a galaxy where asteroids have pummeled planets for billions of years, now one planet strikes back. Yeah, it sort of sounds like the stuff movies are made of. NASA will test an asteroid deflection technique. Asteroids, spacecraft, collisions, basically bumper cars in space. NASA's double asteroid redirection test will intentionally ram itself into an asteroid. Oh, it's dramatic, but in reality, without the melodramatic music. Let's so let I'm, Eagle I'm High graduate. Engineer, so I'm not on the like spacecraft uh, building or the navigation. Or Harrison Agrusa. I'm on the investigation team, which you can kind of think of as like the science team. Make so, it make sense. So the, the smaller asteroid Dimorphos is orbiting around in about a circle around yeah. Didymos. And then once we hit it, we're going to basically hit it head on. So it's going to slow it down so that it'll slow down and its orbit will now shrink and it'll become closer to Didymos, its parent body. And so once we impact it and change its orbit, my job is to run all sorts of computer simulations to predict precisely how that orbit will change. Uh, so, so just to be clear, this isn't a case of this asteroid is threatening Earth and we're out here no. to save it. It's a test. 
Yeah. So this system was specifically designed as an ideal target for a test mission because we know its orbit around the sun very well. So we know it's not going to be a threat to Earth. We know that we won't make it a threat to Earth. So it's it's really like this nice, you know, full scale laboratory in space. We're testing this. We're, we're demonstrating that, yes, in fact, we can build a spacecraft on a short time scale, crash it into an asteroid to change its orbit so that you know, if we ever find an asteroid that is on a collision course with Earth, you know, we've already done the practice run. Okay, so what happens if you do alter this? I mean, is it like that whole butterfly wing kind of thing where if way yeah, down yeah, the road, yeah. it's going to create some sort of chaos? Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously we can't predict everything, but we have the, the heliocentric orbit of this binary asteroid. So we, we know its orbit around the sun with incredible precision. We don't know exactly, but we have a pretty strong idea of how hard we're hitting it. Uh, and the spacecraft is pretty small and you know it's much smaller than the asteroid. So we're only changing the velocity of the asteroid by a very, very small amount. Harrison says it'll be like a vending machine smashing into a football stadium. That football stadium is not gonna move very much. You know what I mean? So much so that it's gonna actually be incredibly hard to even measure how much its orbit around the sun has changed, right? So still as small as that impact will be, it will leave a huge mark on planetary science. Well, I mean, it's got to be pretty cool to be a part of the first time this has ever been. Never yeah. happened. Yeah, it's the first time we've, we're have we demonstrating that, you know, humans can deflect an asteroid, right? If the dinosaurs had a space program, uh, they'd still be walking around uh, today. Yeah, you can't stop earthquakes, can't stop hurricanes. Like, you know, this is one of the volcanic eruptions we can't do much about, but an asteroid uh, is the only thing we can stop if, if we, you know, put the effort into it. To find say, them and deflect. You hope. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. In theory, it's the only thing we can deflect. It's a matter of, you know, we got to detect them first. That's right? true. That's Do you consider yourself a planetary defender then? Uh, yeah. Uh, that's... Anyone that's worked on this, you know, you can actually go onto the uh, APL website and take a quiz uh, and anyone can become a planetary defender. Yes, exactly. Love it. <laughs> so we're, we're uh, like, we're like the same. We're like the same people. Um, yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. So this is it, right? This is it hitting it. It's at 515. This is kind of a replay. I think it would just happen about a minute ago. It's supposed to hit at 515 straight up our time. There it is approaching the asteroid. And then we're going to lose contact with it because obviously it crashes and it's sending us a picture a minute as it's happening live. Never happened before in NASA history either. They were watching something happen live as it happens, and there it goes. That's the crash. And that's the last image we see before that satellite, that spacecraft crashes into that asteroid. Okay, so Dr. Agrusa got his doctorate two weeks ago, and it was about this very experiment. He made all these predictions in his thesis, so now we get to see if he was, well, correct. His work begins right now, after that crash. The goal is to alter Dimorphos' orbit just a little bit. Before today, it took about 12 hours to get around its Didymos uh, planet, or I should say asteroid, the one that it's kind of married to. He told us about 11.92 hours. And if this test works, it's going to be slowed to about 11.8 or 11.7 hours. And they're going to use telescopes to kind of gauge the success. And then four years from now, in 2026, the European Space Agency is going to send a mission to that same space in space. And they're going to be able to send us back pictures of the crater created by DART. So one more look at it. Do we have another look at it? No, it's gone. It already hit. It's done. They're celebrating. We'll be right back.
All right, coverage of hurricanes aren't really a thing here on the 2A because, well, it's Idaho and we don't get hurricanes here. It's just kind of how it works. Hurricane Hank, though, once we did do that, that was three years ago. A little bit of a touchy subject, though, today. Today, we're, th we're mixing things up, though, because we are going to look to where that hurricane happened in Florida, or at least close by to that, as we all watch Hurricane Ian rumble towards the Florida coast, the opposite coast as what it was three years ago. So are the folks at the National Weather Service in Boise. They are also watching what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico. Why? Because they're gathering the data to help with the forecasting efforts. Really? From this far away? Yeah, these weather centers fly two weather balloons per day here in Idaho and also Seattle. But for the next few days, Boise is going to join Seattle, Spokane, Medford, and Missoula, launching two extra weather balloons a day to help track this storm. We're more than 2,600 miles away, so you're probably asking, how are weather balloons in Idaho helping track Ian? Everything's kind of connected as it goes across the continental United States, right? That's how it works. You've seen meteorologist Brie Eggers talk about the flow, the lows and the high, everything kind of circulating and pushing everything every direction. That's how these weather balloons work. A few, she showed us how these weather balloons worked a few years ago. That's where the weather balloon will rise to the occasion. Taking this with it, a radio sonde transmitting information from a cross section of the atmosphere, temperature, humidity, pressure. So it's actually broadcasting uh, once per second this information, and it's got a GPS in there that we use for tracking wind direction and speed. Typically filled with hydrogen or sometimes helium, the balloons are sent up on an important mission. I'm ready. Are you ready? Let's do it. And then it's up, up, and away through the troposphere into the stratosphere, traveling at a speed of about 1,000 feet per minute. And around two hours later, the balloon is at a height of more than 20 miles above the Earth's surface. And through the entire flight, it's sending back important information to our forecast models that will make them work, ideally. Okay, Bree, something 20 miles above us. How is it helping something 2,600 miles away? Incredible, right? It's giving us a cross section of the atmosphere. And so when we're getting more data, better data, more consistent data, that means we're putting more and better data into our forecast models to hope that hopefully they work a little better and more consistently as well. So it's all connected. As we've said before, everything upstream can affect things downstream. And since weather is always trying to find a balance or an equilibrium, you'll kind of get that push and that pull. So things that are happening here in the Pacific Northwest within the last couple of days, today and tomorrow, could actually affect the track and the exact track of what happens with Hurricane Ian. So I wanted to just give you a look at that track currently. It is a category a two storm at this point expected to strengthen into a major hurricane as it crosses over western Cuba. But what I want to point out here is not necessarily the exact forecast, but the cone of uncertainty. And a lot of people look at this and they think, OK, so that's the swath that we can expect uh, those areas to be affected by this storm system. But what it actually is, is it's a line or a guideline of anywhere that this exact forecast track could wobble. So it could take a turn to the west. It could take a turn to the east. So again, all of that data that we're gathering here in Boise, Seattle, Spokane, going in to help the forecast models better determine what exactly happens with Ian, which we'll be keeping a close eye on in the coming days. Brian. All right, thanks, Breit. That helps explain a lot, actually. Thank you.
Right, we got a couple text messages today about the resignation of Chief Lee, Boise Police Chief Lee, and looking for a new one. It's people asking why not just hire from within. A couple of people pointing out that uh, when we first talked to the mayor on Friday, earlier in the day, she said they did an extensive investigation into his background, into who he was, and came up with a good answer and hired him anyway, and now seems to be kind of going the other way. We're hopefully going to talk to the mayor sometime this week, get the answer to some of those questions about what happened between then and now, and going forward, are you going to look within the department to find out? Last comment here really quickly. Wasma Center is amazing. An honor to have it in our state. My question is, why are we moving in reverse when it comes to human rights? Asked Rob and Beth in Nampa. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people here who are asking said people to move here. Like, this is a sanctuary for that kind of mentality, sadly.